So I gave you the hint to find A, H, and K first, and then up here we know that F is the parent. So we have our vertex, and from there we can find our graphing pattern. So we go over 1, up 1, over 2, up 4. So this is the normal, of course. Uh, over 1, up 1, over 2, up 4. And then we can go check this one. Our new vertex is at negative 1, 3. So we know those are H and K. And then our graphing pattern from there, over 1, up 1, over 2, up 1, 2, 3, 4. So it's also normal. Nor I'm going to write it as normal A value, okay? Because that's what controls the graph uh, over and up stuff. So from vertex form, which we'll start with, I'm going to write it as G, which I think should have been here as well. But So G of X in vertex form should be X minus 1, and then squared plus 3. Uh, actually, plus 1, excuse me. X minus negative 1, or X plus 1. In fact, I think just to make it clear, we're, we are writing X minus, but then the 1 is negative. So that's vertex form, and then to get that into standard form, actually before I say that, remember A was just normal, it was 1, so we don't need to write anything in there. You can though if you want. So G of X in standard form, we need to, I guess I don't need those right now. Are you guys good if I just write this as plus 1 now? Yeah. Okay. So we just need to expand this binomial. So multiply everything out. Distribute, distribute, distribute. We'll get x squared plus x plus x plus 1 plus 3. And we have some combining like terms to do. So g of x in standard form will be x squared plus 2x plus 4. Okay. Pretty soon you'll be seeing that form meaning I'll just start here and ask you to factor it back to this form. Well, not with the 3, but factor it back if you can and uh, give me the intercepts, the x-intercepts, and factor it, okay? How'd this go for you after a couple days off? Good, all right. Uh-oh, I saw a not good. All right, grab your notes, please, and I want you to read the stuff that we wrote about standard form on <clears throat> Friday. Should be the last last notes that you have in there. So just take a 30 seconds, 45 seconds to read over that. Also, in this time after you have read it, if you don't have any usable graph paper, can you come up and grab a piece? So what I hope you read was what standard form looks like. We've now seen it quite a few times. <clears throat> Key features from this one that we can readily see are the y-intercept, which is 0, and then whatever c is. So remember, if you plug 0 in, 4x, these two terms are 0, and so it's just y equals c. That's why uh, c is the, is the y-intercept. We cannot see vertex the vertex just by looking at standard form, but we can find it by dividing the opposite of v or negative v. Um, I would rather, I think you'll make less mistakes if you say opposite of v, because it's not saying that this is always going to be a negative number. It's negative and then whatever b is. So maybe as a quick note on your, on your sheet, put in quotes here. Opposite of, if that helps you. Anyway, so we find what b and a are, and we divide b, negative b or opposite of b by 2a, and that gives us some value. And then we plug that back into the function, and so this, the y-coordinate 
is f of whatever that value is, and that gives us our vertex. So we have to do a little work to find the vertex in standard form. And I did skip over, but the a value will be exactly the same as vertex form, and it tells you the same stuff. <coughs> so does it open up or down? Is it compressed or stretched based on the value of the a, of the a in there? So then we got to, let me scroll down a little bit. There we go. So we got to a point where we had found a vertex. So hopefully you have this example in your notes. Can you find it, please? Or maybe this was the one you did, but we did an example of it. So again, we are given a vertex, or excuse me, a standard form quadratic, and we found opposite of B, in this case B was negative 8. B was negative 8, and we found that the opposite of it was 8. We divided it by 2 times A, which was 1, and we got 4. And then the F of negative B over 2A is this part. F of opposite of B over 2A is plugging that 4 in for x. So I should probably put that there, those printing. And then we just solved or found the value of y and got our vertex. Remember doing that a little bit? Okay, so what we're doing today is working on graphing from standard form, at least for the next little, little while. So graphing from standard form requires the same thing as graphing in vertex form, which is start with the vertex. However, we have to do this little bit of work to find the vertex before we can do that. So I want you to write this down as an example, maybe on your graph paper, so that everything is all together there. So we're going to start with the vertex, just like we did before. Hard to know where to graph this if you don't. And we'll write a couple notes on this. I mean, at this point, you guys are getting pretty good at graphing, so they'll be short. So we, we should probably just review A, B, and C just so we have them. So what is A in this one? 1, B, negative 4, and C is 8. So the x coordinate is at opposite of b over 2a, which is opposite of negative 4 over 2 times 1, and that is 4 over 2. And so our x coordinate of our vertex is at 2. Okay, so all we know so far is that it's on the line 2. It's some, some place on that vertical line 2. So uh, let me set up a coordinate grid here. Or I mean an axis. Can you guys see that green color? Is, is that 2A or is it 2A? 2A. Yeah. That looks a little easier to see. And we have a line. Let's see, I'll keep doing that. Let's use red. So we know that our vertex is on this line. That's our axis of symmetry. So if you wanted, at this point, you could say the axis of symmetry is x equals 2, because we know that the vertical line goes through the x-coordinate of the vertex. So it'll be on there somewhere, but we don't know a lot of things yet, right? We don't know if it's up here or down here, and we don't know. I guess that's kind of where we'll pick up. So. The y-coordinate of the vertex is what we need next, which is at f of 2, right? And so we've had this now quite a few times where we're plugging a value into the function, and so that looks like this, 2 squared minus 4 times 2 plus 8. So we need to just plug 2 into our function. And you can do that for any point. Do you remember us practicing making tables of values by plugging x-coordinates in and getting the y? 
And we can, and I called that the backup, like the emergency backup plan. Well, we do need to do that for finding the y coordinate. So for this, we get 4 minus 8 plus 8. The 8's cancel, and we just get 4. So f, well, I don't want to write it that way. I'm going to write it as y. y equals 4. So our vertex is at 2, 4. So again, we have to do some work to even start the graphing process by finding that vertex. So now that we have it, let's go plot our vertex point. So over 2, up 1, 2, 3, 4. What other point can we get fairly quickly just by looking at this? The y-intercept. So what is the y-intercept? It's 0, 8, yeah. So on the pink line, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. There's our y-intercept. Okay, and this is a good reason to just dot in your axis of symmetry. Because I don't have another point. Like, I'm not going to solve for another point that has the coordinates of 8, right? But I can reflect that point across the axis of symmetry and have another point immediately. So... Just on um, two left of the axis of symmetry, so two to the right would be the other point, right? The matching point. Okay. From here, we can see A is 1. So we know it would be over 1, up 1. I could add points there and there to just help with the shape. Now you're kind of seeing what it looks like, right? And I think we're probably good. We could do another, like, over three, up how many? Nine. Yeah. <laughs> if you have room on yours, you could do one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and I run out of room, but you could do the, the nine. Okay. Now, I don't know how, how you guys are doing with graphing these, but here's my advice. At least up here, if I start at a point not at the vertex, it's easier for me to round the vertex. So starting there and go through rounded instead of starting at the vertex. I find if I start at the vertex, it always looks sharp there. Okay? And then pick up going the other way. All right, so there's our parabola. Again, we found the vertex first. Then we plotted it and the y-intercept, reflected the y-intercept, and then added this, in this case, we added just the, the over one, up one point. So let's add that. That looks kind of too much. Standard. -er <laughs> How about just standard? So find the vertex first. which is 0, C. What if you don't see a number at the end? Like if it's just 2x squared plus 3x, then what? Then your y-intercept is 0, right? Did you say that? Yeah. <laughs> Let me add to that. So graph the y-intercept and reflect it across the AOS. I didn't put to graph the AOS. I suppose you could um, <coughs> say that in there. 
craft it, and the AOS. How about that? Okay. And then this is the last part that we'll write. Use A and the graphing pattern to plot one to two more points and reflect over the AOS. Okay. Kind of something we're used to doing. Probably not sure we even needed to write that note, but hopefully it's helpful. Okay, and then let's have you try one. I'll give you a choice. Do you want to try that one or that one? Or this one? All right, give that one a shot. All right, let's go ahead and check in. So finding the vertex, the x coordinate, opposite of b over 2a. b in this case, I guess we didn't do that part, but a is 1, b is negative 6, c is negative 1. So opposite of negative 6 over 2 times 1, and so we get 3, 6 over 2 is 3. <clears throat> That's also our axis of symmetry, and so I'll go ahead and plot that since we know it already. Again, we don't know anywhere yet. We don't have any idea where it is on here. We could analyze it a little deeper, but we might as well just solve for it, right? So, axis of symmetry at x equals 3. So the y-coordinate for the vertex, we say f of 3, and that's going to be 3 squared minus 6 times 3 minus 1. So 9 minus 18 is negative 9, minus 1 is negative 10. Okay, so we know our vertex now, our vertex... Our vertex is at 3, negative 10. The y-intercept at 0, C. So 0, <coughs> negative 1. Excuse me. All right, we have enough to get a good start, at least. So our vertex at 3, negative 10 is there. And then our y-intercept at 0, negative 1 is there. Reflect that point across. So we're left 3, so we go right 3. And from there we could get a pretty good idea of what it looks like or how to graph it. The graphing A is 1, so we just go over 1, up 1, just like we had. So here's how I would do that. I would go over 1, up 1, and then just reflect. Over 2, up 4, and then just reflect. Now we have a really good idea of that. 
parabola, and we know what it looks like. So we can go ahead and graph it. <clears throat> Remember to put arrows on the ends of these. How'd you do? Okay, some things that I'll be checking for when I grade these kind of problems. Number one, is your vertex in the right place? That's super easy for me to see, right? Number two, is it opening the correct direction? Which is also easy to see. Number three, are your other points correctly plotted? So, do you have your y-intercept in the right place? Is it reflected? Do you have your graphing pattern correct? All right. Let's talk about this one. I'm not sure we'll do it, but we might. But what makes this one a little harder? Uh, the decimal, probably not. The yeah, the y-intercept is 500, right? So that meant, that to me, that messes up your scaling. So if you're thinking about like this graph, even if I went by tens and had all these v times 10, I would only get up to looks like 190. So, you know, you might even have to make each of these like 50 or 100, which it's not that it's hard, it just takes a little bit more focus on your on your axis. So, I'm not saying we're not going to do that, we're just not going to do it right now. Questions on graphing? You are going to get more practice, but we are going to move on just for a minute. So, are we good on graphing for now? All right, so guys, standard form is very useful in, I guess, what you'd say out in the real world. So we need to kind of understand how that relates. Does anybody know these words, profit? You guys know what profit means? What is it? You're saying yes. Okay. Some how much you're gaining? Good. Do you know about um, the concept is called supply and demand? Have you heard about that before? Yeah. So how does supply and demand influence price? Talk me through what you know about that. If you don't have enough of like the product, then you're like you need more demand, so the price will be higher. Okay. Good. So, like, think about here. We I don't know if you guys eat peaches, but the, in years when in the spring when the peach a lot of the peaches freeze, those guys there's a lot less of them, right? So the demand probably remains the same, but the supply is less. So what happens to the price of peaches if you want them that year? Yeah, just like Kara said. So the, the price will go up. And then similarly, if there, if we have the market flooded with product, like if we have a big booming year of peaches, like it seemed like this year was that kind of, and there's peaches everywhere, but the demand remains the same, then they're cheaper. So I know for us, we bought two boxes this year at different times, and they were both cheaper than last year for whatever reason. So maybe it was this. All right, so we have these words showing up. Revenue is how much you earn, like how much you get in how much money you get in. Profit is how much you get after you've paid for things that you have to pay for. So what would a peach company have to pay for? Maybe like water and Okay. Like irrigation water, good. What else? Pay the workers to pick. <clears throat> Even if it's them themselves, right? They still have to get paid to do it. Okay? What else? Yeah, like fertilizer, tree trimming, and you know, whatever they do to help mitigate the freeze. Tractor gas, I mean, who knows? It's all incorporated. Even the boxes, right? Have to get accounted for. So those are called expenses. Well, profit would be if we go, if we went down there and bought a $30 box of peaches, we gave them 30 bucks, their profit would be, well, how much did they actually get after they pay for the box, pay the workers, and all that money goes out. And I don't know what that would be for them. But, we have this, for this one, we have this profit function, 
that they're selling headphones at different prices. So my question is, what is the maximum profit they can earn? How, first of all, how do we know it's a maximum? Even if it didn't say that, how do we know that it has a maximum? Yeah, so I want you to start making this connection to from here's an equation, here's a graph, to now here's the real world, okay? So a profit function would be super valuable to a company if they have gathered enough data to create a function model and now they can be like, hey, this year, okay, X, what does X represent in this one? Read carefully, because it's just an X. I don't like these when they don't have a letter that represents what it actually is, but what does X represent? It is, it's the number of headphones they sell. So honestly, a better way to write this function would be this way. P, uh, let's keep a different color. What would P stand for? Price. Profit. Profit as a function of headphone sales, and then make everything an H instead, because it makes way more sense like that. Do you agree that that would tell you probably more information if we use letters that match the story? Okay, so how many headphones they sell will tell them the profit. Anyway, knowing that that negative turns it upside down so it has a maximum is important, right? So how would you find that maximum? Just by looking at this equation, we don't really need to graph it. Find the vertex, and which one are we looking for? X or Y? Start with X, sure. But in order to answer the question, what is the maximum profit, which one do we care about? The Y value, okay? So, I'm going to let you work for a minute to find that maximum profit that they can make. So, you can use either one now, whichever one you like better. But I'll give you a couple minutes to find that maximum profit. And I would also like to know how many headphones they have to sell to make that profit. So we have a function, guys, with, when you're given, will you shut that now? Thanks. When you're given a function, you're given pretty much everything you need, right? You could graph it, you can create a table, you can use it to answer pretty much any question you want. So it's a pretty uh, powerful piece of information. So we know because of A being negative, we know it looks like this, of some sort, right? It's going to look like that. So we have a maximum point, and what kind of variables would go on our axes, just so we, since we're dealing with the story, like a real problem, what kind of axes, labels should I put on here? Like what is X again? Yeah, well, you said it earlier. Yeah. Headphone sales. And Y is the profit. So it's money. Can anybody think of a reason why as you increase headphone sales, it would start dropping again in terms of profit? Say it again. Yeah, or pay for materials to make them. Okay, maybe so. Good. Anyway, we know that that graph, just because of the negative sign, it looks something like that, right? What is A? It's 10. So that's a pretty, pretty, like for us, that's a pretty severe vertical stretch, right? Like, it's not going to probably look that wide, but that's okay. So to find X, we know it's the opposite of B over 2A. And I'm going to go sideways this time. So that is opposite of 700 over 2 times negative 10. And so 700 divided by 20, both of them, essentially, since they're both positive. Uh, what is that, 35? Okay. So in context, that's, how, that's what we 
say when we're talking about in a story. So get used to hearing me say in context, <coughs> which means in the story. What is 35? What does that mean? Say it again. The, the number of headphones. Not price, but you're right. So it's the number of headphones at our vertex, right? So number of headphones sold at the maximum. Uh, so actually, at the vertex, I'm going to say. Okay. And then we go find y or the y coordinate of the vertex. So y equals f of 35. And can someone just help me? Because I don't want to scroll back and forth. So it's negative 10 times 35 squared. And then what? Uh, it's, seven. Is it plus or minus? Minus. minus. Oh, yeah, I have it right here. It must be plus. It's plus. Yeah. Plus 700 times 35. Minus 6,000. Minus 6,000. Good. I personally would just take that and plug it into the calculator. But you can do it in pieces if you want to, also. So, negative 10, and then in parentheses, 35, outside of parentheses, squared. Plus 700, parentheses, 35, and then minus 6,000. So, 6,250. What is that number in context? Total profit, right, in dollars, so $6,250. So they sell 35 headphones and get $6,250. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so anyway, now we know both, we know the answer to both things we wanted to know, which was what is the maximum profit we can make, and... Probably for this company, also just as important is how many headphones do we need to sell in order to get there. So 35 here, 62.50 here. Okay, this is a version of what people in math call optimization. Optimize means get the very best case scenario, right? So if this function rule indeed did describe their profit margin, then they would want to try to sell 35 headphones. <clears throat> okay, how'd that go for you? Do you see how it's the same math as what we've been doing, even for graphing? Like, find the vertex, it's the same math, it's just now buried down in here in the story. Yeah. Sure. Give me one minute to stick something up here and then I'll be I'll do this. Alright, here's a more common, probably you'll see these kind more often. So a water balloon was thrown from a window. Anybody ever done that? You have? Anybody ever had a water balloon fight? Yeah, it's fun. Except for our water here is pretty cold even this summer. So. Anyway, so this now models the height of the water balloon rather than profit. It's modeling a height. And embedded in here, and we'll talk in a minute, but embedded in here is some physics information that we can pull off if we wanted. It says, what was the maximum height of the water balloon after it was thrown? Okay? This time, so I'll, I'm not going to say how to do it. I just want you to think through but this time I also want you to sketch the graph as well, okay? So sketch means you don't have to like set up a perfect and plot all the points. A sketch is like this, like, right? Label the axis, so label, label, and do something, whatever it is, okay? It doesn't look like this exactly, so that's why I didn't want to give you the answer, but 
I do want you to sketch it. The sketch should take like 30 seconds or less. So to sketch this, let's use, let's just use the A value and what we know it tells us and the Y intercept. Just starting there. Okay. So, first of all, we're throwing a water balloon from a window. So do I need a graph that looks like this? I want you to think in real life. Do I need a graph that looks like that? Why not? Okay, so I'm starting somewhere up here, and it's going to fall down till it hits the floor. Is, is it going to ever go down below that? Like, can a water balloon just keep going past the ground? No. Okay, so that tells us two things. I don't need negative time, and I don't need negative height. That makes no sense. In context, that makes no sense. So, honestly, I would probably set my graph up like this. I do like you to leave a little, I don't like just pure L graphs like this, they're okay, but I feel like if you have it just showing the other three quadrants, like a little snippet of it, it at least helps you orient a little better. Here's what you should have written on the Y, or excuse me, the X axis is time, and on the Y axis, height. Height measured in feet. Does it give you any? No. Okay. So height measured in feet, time measured in seconds. Okay. Now, if you don't know your physics, which I don't expect you to necessarily know that, you probably didn't necessarily know feet and seconds. Why? Does anybody know why we can look at this equation and know it's feet and seconds? Does anybody know that? Okay. This 16, or negative 16 right here, it comes from the acceleration due to gravity on Earth. What does that mean? What does gravity do to objects in the air, or just in general? pulls them down, but it's pulling them down in an, it's called acceleration, where it's getting faster and faster all the time. Have you heard of terminal velocity? If you drop an object from high enough up, it will eventually reach a point where it's not speeding up anymore, because of the friction of the air, but gravity's trying to speed it up, constantly speeding it up. And this 16 comes from that, and the acceleration due to gravity is feet per second squared. It's 32.2 feet per second squared. So every second it gets faster by 32.2 feet per second, which is pretty fast. Think of it flying across this room in one second and getting faster by that amount every second. It's kind of a hard concept to understand, but the physics and the calculus behind it, we have to split that in half, and that's where the 16 comes from. Okay? This 160 is our initial velocity. What is velocity? Yeah. And in fact, for this, let's just use the word speed. And I'm telling you this because it's important to know. We're going to do quite a few of these kind of problems. Okay? So that's the initial speed of the throw. 160 feet per second is super fast. Like, this isn't your average kid. <laughs> So it's a little unrealistic. Okay, 50. You guys should be able to tell me what that is. X. No? It's not an X. It's a what? Y. It's a Y. Of what? That's where we started from. Okay? It's the Y intercept. So on your graph, if you didn't do this, please do. It starts at 50 feet. So that is our, in math, it's our y-intercept, but it's also how high we started from. So we call that the initial height. 50 feet up is how many stories, roughly? Five, yeah, about five stories. So this is like a tall apartment building or like the... 
bank of, what is that bank you said, Daniel? Alpine Bank, isn't it roughly five stories? Okay. Maybe, maybe a part, like three quarters of the way up Alpine Bank. So we're, we're like way up there throwing this balloon, okay? 50 feet. Uh, the top of this building is about 20, so it's like two and a half times that. So if you get hit with this balloon, it's going to hurt, right? <laughs> you better run. Anyway, here's how I want you to think of this. We know it's a parabola because it's squared. All parabolas graph squared. So it's going to do this, like that. But which part of this do we actually care about? We only care about that piece, right? We don't care about, there's no such thing as back here, because that's like time in the past, which you were probably sitting in your kitchen filling your balloon up, right? So we just care about this solid piece. How many of you graphed that? Way to go. Good job. And of course, to answer the question, what is the maximum height? We care about the vertex, which is a max. <laughs> Right? Okay. Well, we need to find neg negative or opposite of B over 2A. So, X is opposite of B over 2A, which is opposite of 160 over 2 times negative 16. You're going to see that negative 16 in all of these problems where we're throwing, shooting, launching stuff. Okay? because it's a constant on Earth, or a relative constant. If we're throwing something on the moon, that number has to change, because the gravity is different on the moon. And so we just divide that, I don't know what that is, 160 divided by 32, we get 5. Okay, so our coordinate takes place at 5, I'm going to tell you that if you can throw a balloon that reaches its peak five seconds after you threw it, you should be in the Major League Baseball, in the Major League Baseball. Yeah, you threw it up at 10 miles an hour. Yeah. <laughs> okay? And it's going up. Think about the last time you threw something and it's going up for five seconds. No way, right? Anyway, but it's still fun to think about. So we're going f of 5 and just barely can't see. So negative 16 times 5 squared plus 160 times 5 plus 50. Thank you for doing that conversion, by the way. Kyler, thank you for doing that conversion. Alright, so negative 16 times 5 squared plus 160 times 5, plus 50. All right. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Why am I laughing? Yeah, he threw the balloon 450 feet <laughs> in the air, right? So five seconds of flight time to the max, that's not even counting the trip back down. And 450 feet in the air. I would love to see someone throw a water balloon like that. You couldn't even launch one out of a... Well, you might be able to launch one out of those big water balloon launchers that high. 450 feet, though. That's like... <laughs> Those model rockets, like some of those only go that high, right? Anyway, how'd you guys do? How many of you got there? Good. All right, good deal.